Um, so um, thank you ever so much um, for everyone for joining us this evening. Um, Tom from Celtech um, Embryo Transfer has very kindly given up his evening and spent um, time putting a presentation together for us. Um, and I'm sure will give us a fantastic insight into um, the embryo transfer process and industry and very open to answering all sorts of questions in relation to that topic. Um, we've just had a chat in terms of how to manage the questions and feel free to pop them on as we go along. Tom will keep an eye on them because it might be that it's something that he's going to cover later on. Um, but then we'll come back to questions at the end and kind of open the floor up for as many questions as possible. Um, so without further ado, I will kindly pass over to Tom um, and I hope you all enjoy this evening. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Um, I just want to take time to thank, thank uh, Holstein UK for inviting me to do this. I have done a few things like this in the past, but I would say um, this is the first one I've, I've hosted on my own. Um, so um, my webinar this evening is going to be about what is embryo transfer and how can it benefit you and your business? So just sort of a brief introduction that um, I'm Tom Lomas. Um, some of you may or may not recognize me. Uh, there's a picture of me here when I was um, a runner up in the President's Medal. Um, I'm from a Derbyshire Hill farm. Um, I originate, I, I only work with beef and sheep when I was growing up. Um, that pushed me to go to Reese Heath College where I did an NCA, an ANCA and a foundation degree. And um, what stimulated my passion for dairy. Um, I then started a business with Richard Bostock, um, what involved uh, showing, clipping, um, selling, preparation of cattle, and um, it involved me traveling all over the world. And I won't change a minute of it. And I recommend any young person who leaves college or leaves university and, and has a few years and a bit of time, um, it's a very good start to getting a foothold in this industry. Um, that involved, uh, led to me working for Mark and Susan Knutsford um, at Riverdale Holsteins. I did some of their winter clipping and I did some of their showing. And um, that's when they said, would I like to go and work for Celtech Embryo Transfer? Now I was a non-vet and I was kind of aware that non-vets could do embryo transfer, but um, it's quite challenging for a non-vet to do it. Um, I, uh, I had to enroll on various courses um, uh, to become an embryo transfer practitioner um, that they make it quite difficult for people like me to do it so only the keen people actually do it um, and then I have to have a supervising vet who has implicit trust in me and my work um, to allow me to go out in the field and, and practice embryo transfer. Um, I've worked at Celtec for about nine years and um, what's led me to being a, a partner in the business and I'm a board member of the British Embryo Transfer Association, and I'm the only non-vet who's uh, affiliated with uh, ET practice on that board. So I'm quite proud of that. So that's that's hopefully what um, what gives me the reason why I, I can I can give you this webinar today. So this is a it's a very whistle stop tour of embryo transfer. Uh, please bear with me. Um, there's there's some some large words said at times and sometimes it's baffling because to me it's just day-to-day -day work where some of you um, will come across these terms i know that i'm dealing with maybe some young, very young breeders i know that i'm dealing with some maybe some vet students so i'm trying to pitch it somewhere in between and hopefully everyone gets an idea about embryo transfer so let's start with the basics what is the definition of embryo transfer embryo transfer or abbreviated to et is the removal of a fertilized embryo or embryos, which are then implanted into recipients to, to establish a pregnancy. It's as simple as that. So we have various types of embryo transfer. We have surgical embryo transfer, what's in vivo, non-surgical embryo transfer, what's in vivo. So in vivo basically means what's in the cow, what's, what's in the living thing, where we also have IVF, what's done outside of the cow in a lab. Um, I've highlighted non-surgical embryo transfer because that's what we're going to be focusing on today. This is um, the most common practice done in the UK within bovines, within cows. Um, so that's what the main discussion is about. Um, I've also added donors and uh, recipients to this list because I'm going to be saying donors and I'm going to be saying recipients a lot. Um, the donors are basically the animal what's donating the embryo and the recipient is the animal what's receiving it. 
Um, so hopefully you understand um, when, I, when I'm using these terms. So if we get back to basics, hopefully we all, we all know what a bulling cow is. Well, this is called the bovine estrus cycle. Normally breeding age cattle have an estrus cycle, what usually happens every 21 days, every three weeks. Now this can happen between 18 and 23, but generally it's every 21 days. Um, you would then, if you decided you wanted to get that animal pregnant, you would serve it with a stock bull or use frozen semen. Um, this is called artificial insemination to impregnate the cow or the heifer. Then the cow or heifer would then continue to carry on and have its own calf. And that would be the end of that. That's sort of the, the cycle we all know. So what do we do if we want more? Um, Naturally, a cow only ever has one calf at a time, sometimes two, with some exceptions. From, can you see from this incredible picture, this, this girl's had four. Um, it's very, very unusual. And um, this is just down to evolution. Cows have, have evolved to only have one or two because, um, because of the size they are and, and how they had to cope in the wild. Um, so if we want more offspring from these elite animals, um, the most effic efficient way and effective way uh, to do this is through embryo transfer. Um, so let's take a look at a cow's reproductive organs. So just before we do that, a little cool fact for you is the odds of a cow having triplet heifers are one in eight million. Now, there was at Riverdane, we had a cow called Jo Lee, and um, she actually had triplet heifers on the 29th of February. So if anyone's a mathematician, if they want to work out the odds of that, I'm sure it'll be close to a billion, but um, yeah, pretty cool. So this is the reproductive tract of a cow. You can find this probably anywhere on the internet. Um, I'm sure this, this is going up on YouTube maybe after, so um, you can go back to it if you'd like to watch this uh, webinar again. Um, uh, most of you all know, know, know this. Um, so obviously we have the, the vulva, uh, the bladder and the vagina. Uh, we have the rectum, what's situated above here. Um, but we're not really too fussed about that bit in this lecture and um, it's from this point onwards so we'll start with the cervix the cervix is a barrier and um, it's made of cartilage and this is sort of what blocks um, any uh, manure or any um, any urine or any sort of uh, baddies getting beyond um, this point into a sterile uterine environment so so this is sort of the uh, blocking device really um, we then move on to the uterus so this is the uterine body and um, this splits off into a right side and a left side. So we have a right horn and a left horn. And then we have the oviduct, either a right oviduct and left oviduct. We also know that as the fallopian tube. You may, when you were back in school, you might have heard it called the fallopian tube before. And what's situated at the end of them is the ovaries. So hopefully this is a, we've all probably seen something like this. Um, you, what, what, what it does is it, it just gives you an oversight of a cow's anatomy as we get further and further down the line and some of the terms I'm talking about. So let's start at the very beginning. When a cow comes in estrus bulling, she releases a pre-fertilized embryo. Now we call this an oocyte. So an embryo is, is when it's fertilized, pre-fertilization is an oocyte. This oocyte was contained in a follicle which was within the ovary. So as we've said, cows normally only have one or two follicles. So if we look at these, uh, these small follicles here, and as they grow, they start becoming a primary follicle. And what happens is one is selected. And this the others start regressing. And this one continues its journey um, and growing and growing and eventually becomes a mature follicle. Or you may have heard of the term a dominant follicle. Once he gets to the cow, he's actually bulling. It has a it has a surge of uh, of hormone, of which uh, it, it basically surges and forces the cow to ovulate, and out out the oocyte pops, leaving this this open wound uh, within the ovary um, where the follicle was. So we know that's ovulated. We know that's released. We call this ovulation. So what we'll do is we'll forget about that for a second, because what happens then? It then continues. It's still important. Four to five days later, the, the this the, the follicle then starts sort of turning into a, a yellow, bo yellow body tissue. And we call this a corpus luteum. Now, the reason why this is essential is that a corpus luteum gives off progesterone. 
and progesterone is what is essential to keep the cow pregnant. Without a corpus luteum in the first sort of 60 or 80 days, the, the, the cow just wouldn't stay pregnant. So this is absolutely essential. And I'll be talking about CLs and corpus luteum a lot. So what we've got is obviously we've got this follicle, what's gone through the process, it's ovulated, it's become a corpus luteum. Well, what happens if we want more? So what we use is a drug called FSH or follicle stimulating hormone. And what this allows us to do is when a cow has had a course of FSH, instead of recruiting one and um, uh, what becomes a primary follicle and then a mature follicle, it actually recruits two or four or multiple, eight, you know, it just depends on, on the female herself. But then that allows, instead of when it gets to the mature folli follicle stage, there'll be six ready to ovulate or multiple uh, follicles ready to ovulate rather than just a single one. So hopefully that understands that's what we're using the FSH for to recruit more follicles to then have more for ovulating. So I um, I apologise for this really a little bit because um, this this is a you know it's it's a bit advanced, um, but um, basically it's. I, I, the next slide will explain it a little bit more, but I'll just go through it. So after ovulation, the oocytes are caught in a basket surrounding the ovary called the infundibulum. The oocytes are then funnel down the, down the oviduct, uh, down to the oviduct, um, or what we call the fallopian tube, either or oviduct fallopian tube. The fallopian tube is split into two parts. The top part is called the ampulla, and the bottom part is called the isthmus. The embryo is moved through the fallopian tube by hair-like structures called cilia. And these basically sweep the brushing. So the embryo doesn't just fall. It's not gravity what takes it down. These, these hair-like structures are sweeping the embryo gradually and gently down, well, sorry, the oocyte gently down to about halfway down the, the, um, the fallopian tube. So fertilization basically is where the semen meets the oocyte, it takes place halfway between the ampulla and the isthmus. The oocyte now becomes what we call an embryo or embryos. And we can also use the term at this point called eggs once they've been fertilized. After five to six days, the embryos drop into the uterus um, at the point of the UTJ, what's the uterine tubular junction. So I, I, most of you, that, that won't mean a lot. Some of you, it will mean you'll, you'll be fine with that. But the, hopefully this slide, courtesy of select sires, I've had to expand it a bit more than I'd like. but um, hopefully it sort of totally makes sense. So if I just flick back two slides, we've seen the ovulation here popping out and it's left this cavity. If I go back again, we've got that here. So around the ovary, so we've got the ovary, we've got the ovulation, and around the ovary is the infundibulum. So as you, as you can see, it's like a funnel and it funnels it down. Now, unfortunately, this hasn't got the cilia on it, the hair-like structures. What's well, a bit of a shame because this is a really nice picture and it would explain a lot if it just had them on. But anyway, that's fine. So it, it moves, the oocyte is moving down through the ampulla, what's this top half of the, uh, of the oviduct. And as you can see here, although it's not the greatest picture, I know there's, these are sperm cells. So these sperm cells are going to meet with the oocyte and that's where the fertilization would take place. Once that happens, the embryo is going to continue its journey. Now it's an embryo and it's going to move all its way down into the isthmus area and eventually to the uterine tubular junction. And that's right at the tip of the uterus. So as you can see, it drops in here about day five or six. Now we're only able to recover this embryo once it's within this area. That is so thin, it's about as thin as a hair. So we're unable to flush any, any area above the UTJ. So this is part of the reason what I'm gonna come on to later, but it's essential that we flush on day seven to allow the em embryos to, to drop into the uterus itself. So it's a great, great diagram this, we've got ovulation down uh, through the infundibulum into the oviduct, fertilization takes place, and then by day five or six is out into the uh, tip of the uterus. So flushing, um, if I can just move, come on, can I move that? Can I move that bit? So I'm just moving my own uh, face out of the way. Um, so yeah, flushing, um, 
by day five or six, we've just discussed that. We hope for all the embryos now uh, to be dropped within the uterus, ready for collection. Um, so on day seven, one week later, the embryo transfer team will arrive, arrive to flush your do donor. So a week prior, you've uh, inseminated her or she's been mated with a stock bull. Um, she's been in estrus and then seven days later, we arrive. Uh, the donor first receives an anaesthetic, um, a caudal nerve block, what we call an epidural. Some of you will be familiar with that term. And um, this is so she doesn't feel the procedure um, because we just, you know, it's not, not nice for her because we're, we, we, it could be taking 30 minutes to flush the, flush the donor. But also for us, um, it stops any peristalsis within the rectum. It prevents the cow squeezing our arm. It's quite a delicate procedure and we're working with a lot of soft tissue. So it's a lot safer for us and the, uh, and the donor if, um, if she can't feel anything. Um, obviously, once this is done, um, a catheter is inserted through the cervix and up each horn or the uterus one side at a time. Uh, so if we take a look at the diagram, what we do is we have our bag of flush fluid at the top and this is coming by, by a Y-piece tubing. Um, it's a two-way system. So then we've obviously inserted the catheter through. Now, I don't fully think this diagram is totally accurate. We'd like to see this, um, this catheter further up. We believe that the, the embryos are more situated in the tip of the horn, and we like to be flushing the last third of the horn. But anyway, this diagram is still pretty good. We inflate a cuff. Um, this basically blocks off the lumen of the horn. It, it, it stops any fluid going backwards because all we want it to do is go back where it came from, back down the catheter itself. So we blow that cuff off and it prevents any fluid going either side of it. So fluid goes in, literally it's flushed around and then it's flushed back out. And this, is, this goes back out, out the out valve and uh, into an embryo micropore filter. Um, this is said to be half the size of an embryo, the gauze, what's on the bottom. So there's no chance of an embryo actually slipping through the net. Um, and then that is then moved on to the microscope um, to see what we can recover. So uh, I've briefly talked about one reason why we don't collect uh, embryos on, uh, why we collect on day seven. Part of the reason is because they're not there till day five or six, and we won't be able to reach them before this. Um, as the embryo multiplies and divides its, its cells, it actually keeps getting larger. So eventually the embryo breaks its shell, or we call this term hatching, around day or eight, nine. Now the problem is if they hatch, uh, they become more delicate to handle, cells can fall away. They're also harder to find under the, under the microscope because they become nearly see-through. And also we really, we can freeze them, but really we're unable to freeze them at this stage. So that's why day seven is, is seen as the perfect time really, because we can freeze them and we can handle them properly. So what do embryos exactly look like? I thought this was a fantastic diagram, great picture. Um, it shows the whole cycle of, of an embryo. Um, as we can see here, this is, a, this is what a day one single cell embryo. Um, it's probably just been fertilized. So you imagine halfway down the ov oviduct, this has just been fertilized. What we've got here is around, this is outer ring is called a zona pellucida. And you can probably see it better on this one. So on this graph three, we, that is the zona pellucida. We sometimes call it a zona. You can call it a shell. Just think about it. Think of it as a shell on an egg. That's all it is. It's keeping everything intact in place. So then after fertilization, we've got it multiplying and dividing. So two, four, eight, 16, 32. And on our collection day, this is sometimes what the embryos will look like. Now we call this a 64 cell day seven morula. Now, morula in Latin means mulberry. Now, this is maybe a little bit more like a mulberry, but this maybe isn't the greatest example, but basically it looks like a blackberry in the center. It's a cluster of tight cells that look like a blackberry or a mulberry right in the center. Now, we'll only really see embryos up to probably stage 11. Um, we're collecting them in this stage, and what happens, they go to 128, 250, 500, this is what we call a blastocyst at this stage. This is a blastocyst. And then we've got an expanded blastocyst. And if you if you look hard on the uh, on the outer shell again, the outer shell is really thinning now because it's got that large. It's really thin the shell, and that's because it's getting ready for hatching. And as we can see on graph twelve and thirteen, 
it's literally it's got that large and it's thinned the shell that much it's actually hatched out and it's going to start expanding and elongating but but when we come to collect embryos really they'll be between sort of seven eight nine and sometimes ten really so hopefully that's a pretty cool picture for you they don't ex always exactly look like this under the microscope but it's, it's a great it gives you a great idea of what what they do look like so quick recap so far, because I know it's a lot and I'm, I'm speaking quite quickly because I don't want to take up the whole of your evening. Um, we've learned that a cow has an extra cycle of which normally they only ovulate one embryo. Uh, we use an a hormone called FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, to recruit more follicles. That means more oocytes, and then that means more embryos. Uh, we understand a little bit more about the journey of an embryo and how your embryo transfer team collects them. Uh, so now let's talk about the process. So you've decided to flush a donor. That's the first thing you've got to do. You've, you've got to make a decision, right, I want to flush a cow, I want to flush a donor. So you'll give Celltech a call or whoever you'd like to use, and you put the donor on the programme. This is a term we use. What basically means you're going to start a programme, then what is basically um, a form, what you follow. It's got timed um injections and timed uh, ai's on it so that's why we call it a program uh, cell tech works uh, very closely with you and your local vet and um, that's essential really your vet does need to be involved um, to make sure that this cow has a nice corpus luteum or cl um, that's absolutely essential for the success of the program um, flushing wouldn't work without it. So it is it is important that your vet's involved um, and we're involved in the build up to flushing the donor. And the donor will then proceed to get FSH intramuscular injections over the course of four days. And during this process, she's induced into uterus bullying with a hormone called prostaglandin. This is so it's uh, we, we bring her uh, on heat at the right time when the follicles are at the right stage. It's also so that the AI is timed, so you know when to be looking for it, uh, the donor bullying. And it's also so we can schedule our diary so we can be with you a week later. Uh, the donor is then served over a 24 hour window, usually three times, about eight hours apart. And um, this is a bit I don't want to I'm not going to spend too long talking about this, but um, this was very much the way, way with um, when we were just using conventional semen um, years ago. Things have changed now, especially in the dairy sector. We're using a lot of sex semen. I know there's, you know, four million, two million sperm cells rather than fifteen or twenty. So extra services could be required. More straws could be required. It's more about speaking with your vet, speaking to fellow farmers, what they've done, speaking to uh, cell tech. Um, the reason is there's an elevation of hormone and this actually kills the sperm quicker. Um, so more semen is required. But, but like I say, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just more about um, good communication and, and just asking what bulls are working, what bulls aren't. And that's uh, your AI te uh, technician or your AI representative is always a good person to speak to. Um, so then Celtech will come one week later to flush your donor. So now we've been out, we flush the donor, what's next? So we have some embryos. Your embryologist has sorted the viable embryos from the non-viable embryos. Sometimes you'll get unfertilized embryos. Sometimes you'll get what we call degenerate embryos. They've just died off during the process. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. We can't do anything with the with the non-viable ones, but hopefully you've got some, some viable ones. We've then graded them for quality. These are grades one, two, and three, of which one is the highest. Um, we always recommend lining up one or two recipients for any grade twos or threes because they don't always freeze as good as the, the ones. But if you haven't got any recipients, it's fine, we'll still freeze them. Um, if you have no recipients on the day of collection, we'll just proceed to freeze them, that's fine. If you have viable uh, recipients, then we can proceed to transfer them fresh and uh, try to make some pregnancies. Um, little cool fact, liquid nitrogen is the coldest substance known to man with a temperature of minus 196 Celsius. I think that's its actual boiling point. It could even be colder. It could be about minus 200, but, um, but yeah, it's pretty cold. So, Recipients and implanted embryos. So, so you've actually got some recipients on the day. Um, that means then we load the embryo into a straw. That's just the same as a semen straw. They look identical. Um, the difference is it's inserted into an embryo transfer gun. 
This is thinner. The reason why it's thinner is because the cervix is tightly closed when we come to implant the embryo. And um, also it's about a couple of inches longer. That's because we are going into the uterus. Um, the recipient receives an epidural again, um, and then the technician proceeds to feel which side she's ovulated on. We are looking for a CL to maintain the pregnancy. So there's, um, there's a higher conception rate if we actually implant the embryo it, where it was meant to come from. So if she's ovulated on the right, we want to be implanting the embryo on the right side because that's where it would naturally be. And that's where the embryo can send a signal to the brain and the CL can send a signal to the brain and they can all interlink. The, the technician delicately passes through the cervix of the recip and then implants the embryo in the last third of the horn on the same side as our ovulation. The reason for the last third of the horn, especially with frozen embryos, is just that embryo has got to get a signal to the brain and um, it's better if it's at where it's meant to be in the last third of the horn and further up the horn where the signal's not as strong and actually the pH can be slightly different. Um, so yeah, that's basically, it looks like an AI, but there is a lot more going on and it is important, um, you know, it is a delicate procedure. Um, there is a technical ability in it. Um, and these technicians, you know, th th they are highly skilled people because it's, you know, it's very soft tissue you're working with. Um, you know, so um, a technician can really make a difference on your pregnancy rate. So donor and recip selection. Uh, firstly, let's talk about uh, donor and recip selection regarding trying to achieve a successful pregnancy rate. Donors need to be fit and healthy, no visible signs of illness or discomfort, i.e. lameness. If a cow's lame, if it's sick, um, if it's not been cycling regular, like if, if it's just generally not been, not been great, they are usually not the best candidates for embryo transfer. Um, obviously, a lot of you are very good stockmen out there. You know when a cow's right. I'm not going to tell you how to do it because you know when a cow's right. But working with your vet, um, your own knowledge, even speaking to us, um, it can all help. Um, there are the odd occasion where, you know, you're sending a cow away. Um, her time's done on the farm and you want to take a quick flush. Then there are exceptional circumstances. Um, ideally, you'd be seeing regular visible Easter cycles, regular heats, just to show that she's normal and she's functioning correctly. Um, also, you've spoken to your vet, you've spoken to Celtech, just to assure that uh, the donor is viable. So if you if you rang us up and said, hi, Tom, uh, my cow's come bulling, she's 30 days into her uh, into lactation, she's a milking heifer, we would maybe recommend leaving her another cycle, if not two, um, just because we want to see her regularly bulling. We want to see her getting into lactation, getting past any sort of negative energy drops or, you know, and getting just sort of on a steady ticking over. When, when you feel that you would AI her and she would get in calf is a great time to force your cow. So, um, yeah, just speaking with Celtech, speaking with your local vet, it can, it, can, it can make a difference between a successful flush or not. Same with recipients, similar credentials apply. Um, you believe the recipient will carry and also carve the embryo naturally. We really want to, you know, believe that this embryo is, if this, this uh, recipient is big enough and strong enough, she's going to carry it, she's going to carve it. The recipient has, uh, has visible signs of estrus and is free from all signs of illness and distress, same as, same as the donors. Um, young recipients, i.e. maiden heifers and first calf heifers, are usually more fertile than older cows. I don't really need to explain why they have, you know, older cows have bigger uteruses, they've had more problems, they're giving more milk. You know, and your main efforts and your first calf efforts, that's that's the, the animals I would be using for recipients. Also, really try to make life easy um, as possible to manage them. I mean, I've used a purse picture here with some uh, locking yokes. Um, it doesn't have to be locking yokes. It can be a crush. It can be um, a nice race. But if it's easy, there's a lot there's a lot of work involved with ET in terms of injections and um in terms of like the program and, and you know, you, it's, it's, you are heavily involved, but if it's easy, you do it. It's, it, it's simple and you enjoy doing it. But if it's hard work and uh, you, you just eventually you'll stop doing it. So try to make, you know, recipient management as easy as possible. So let's get you some great results. Um, there's always some luck when you embark on your embryo transfer journey. That is no question. But however, there are plenty of things you can do to influence that luck. Feeding is the, the number one big one. 
Um, there's, a, there's a great vet out there called Neil Howey, who did a fantastic lecture on, uh, on feeding. For any of them, you uh, sort of vet students out there who really want to go into in depth detail about it. I, if you contact me to do with the British Embryo Transfer Association, we can maybe um, show you some of them webinars if you want to know more about it. But basically, we're looking for high energy and low protein. And we're looking for dry feed. We want we want straw, haze, dry silage. We don't want lactic acid. We don't want acidic silage. Um, that that sort of it leaches uh, leaches through the room and wall um, in the form of ammonia. It shows in the, up in the blood as urea, and it actually changes the pH within the oviduct within the fallopian tube. And if the pH is acidic, um, the embryo just won't hold. Um, other things are things like minerals. Um, if you've got lockouts on your farm, um, you might be low. Your, your forages might be low in certain minerals. Uh, ventilation is a big one. Cows getting too hot, uh, uncomfortable panting. Um, it's not ideal when cows or any raising temperature is not ideal for for embryo transfer. Same with vaccinations. Um, viruses such as IBR can raise a cow's temperature, can raise a recipient's temperature. Um, thus meaning the embryo just won't hold. Um, spotting estrus is a massive one. You know, unfortunately, um, we, we know if your animal has been in estrus and we can feel that she's got a great corpus luteum, but we can't always tell exactly when it is. And if it's a day out or two days out of synchrous, then we will be implanting the embryo at the wrong stage and then, and then the embryo just won't hold. Um, so it is quite important that we spot these 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 recipients fully and then bedding and comfort you know the more the more they can be laying down the comfier they are um, not everyone has a beach with some beautiful sea and cliffs but but if you can uh, if you can definitely uh, if you can definitely make them as comfy as possible make them as happy as possible it will help with your uh, with your pregnancy rates so all we're trying to do is we can gain a couple of percent here and a couple of percent there they all add up and it could mount to 10 or 20 percent difference in your pregnancy rate so yes you understand all this but but why do it why bother with embryo transfer so why you why use us there are many reasons uh why so i'm just going to bullet point some ideas and then we'll talk a little bit more in depth uh, so to make money then um, to make money to make more money uh, to make some even more money and then so you can go and buy some more cows with that money that you've made so I'm kind of saying that as a bit of a joke, but at the same time, I'm serious. The only reason we visit any farm is to make the money. Like farms aren't a place of hobby. Yes, we get enjoyment and pleasure out of them, but the reason a farmer invites us onto their farm consistently is because we are in some way, shape or form making his business better or his or hers business better. So examples are to sell embryos. Um, I've purchased embryos over £3,000 an embryo. I have sold them for between 500 and 1000 There is a lot of money and quick money in buying and selling in the trade of embryos all over the world. Um, if that isn't for you, you can also um, implant them and sell the resulting progeny, i.e. show calves. We have big sales, um, big shows across the UK, um, or milkers. You can sell milkers. You can sell stock bulls, especially in the beef industry. The stock bull trade is huge. Um, to improve a specific trait in your herd, if you want to raise your herd 500 kilos of milk, you want to improve mastitis, you want to improve lameness, you want to improve your fertility, you want to improve your type, you want your cows to last longer, you want them to have better udders, better feet and legs, you want to reduce the stature, you want to make them wider. These are all things that embryo transfer can amplify and speed up within your, within your herd. Um, you want to intensify elite genetics within your herd from your best females. So you might have two, two heifers carve in, one's given 45 kilos a day, one's given 35 kilos a day. They're on the same feed, they've been reared in the same environment. It's clearly genetics what is having its, having its role in, in choosing a superior female. So you might want to take embryos from the superior females and implant them in the inferior ones um, to obviously increase your genetic gain. Um, you never have to have progeny from an inferior female. I mean, this is this is a bit more extreme, but arguably you could do something like genotype all your heifers and choose um, 
all the all the high ones, the top 20%, the top 15% of the high ones, you can flush them and plant all the embryos in the bottom 30%. And that way genet your genetic gain is going up a lot quicker than, than and, and, and also you could just breed them bottom 30% to beef. Well, if you implant embryos in the, it's happening a hell of a lot quicker than if you were just to, you know, use sex semen and just use beef. Um, to have progeny born from one female at different times a year, I think this is quite a good one because I have a cow, a specific cow, and she's, she breeds amazing show calves. So sometimes I'll, I'll flush her and I'll put in two embryos or three embryos now and I'll put some in um, later on, four months later. So I've got calves for different classes. Um, the other thing is bulls. Some farms want, want bulls in um, May. I think they want them in October, possibly January. So there's many, many different reasons. It's really endless. Um, at Celtech, we are definitely part of your team, and that's all we see ourselves are. The day we're not is the day, the day you give us up. Um, we're here for you and your breeding goals. It's um, that that's up to you. You have your own individual breeding goals. If you're from a thousand cow herd, if you're from a fifty cow herd, from your if you farm at a thousand feet above sea level, if you farm at sea level, it's all very um, unique to you and your farm. And we can adjust and um, adapt to you and your system. And hopefully we can also put you in contact with people who might be able to help you and your team. Um, embryo transfer is like farming. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And, and you know, a gestation period of a, of a cow is nine months, um, is two years. So you're looking at nearly three years, the best part of three years before that resulting embryo is going into your herd. Um, I advise that if you want to do it, you know, you stick at it, you grit your teeth, you take the ups and the downs. And after five years or 10 years, you, you evaluate it and you look back and, and you see, have my classifications raised a point? Have my rear udders raised a point? Have, uh, has my uh, PLI gone up 100 points? You know, that's the only way to look at this is in the long term game. So, so this point, hopefully I haven't taken too much of your time. I, uh, I know I've uh, sort of whistled through it. Uh, there's a lot to take in, um, so I apologise, but hopefully you found it useful um, and we can take a few questions now. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, for that. That was really insightful. Thank you. Um, so if we've got any questions, if people want to put their questions in the chat, part um then we can we can go through those then as they come through um that would be great um i guess um a question from me tom i um i'm involved a bit with the paperwork side of things so a lot of um embryos that are coming in from abroad and then being implanted and then sort of the paperwork side that's needed from there how many is it are a lot of em embryos coming in from abroad or do people tend to just use them on farm a lot or is it a lot of trade within them um, no the, the, there is there is a big trade from um from abroad um a huge amount um obviously brexit slowed a lot of things down um unfortunately paperwork is um is a is a big thing in the trade of embryos there's got to be negotiations between countries to trade them um I mean, I wouldn't say that we export that many embryos in the UK. We haven't done, um, we do do some, especially into, you know, even Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland is definitely still classed as exporting, especially into Europe. And recently we have been sending, we sent some embryos recently to New Zealand. We've sent embryos to, um, to America and Canada, excuse me, recently. I think maybe like being online now, um, email, uh, like Facebook, things like that has really, um, really just made the, the world quite a small place. And it's, um, it's, it's not much for me to email someone in America and, um, and within a few, two months, I might have some embryos from there over here. But obviously there's a higher cost. It's what you feel um, is worth it because obviously these embryos are good cows in America. Um, you know they're not cheap and you might be able to you might have an equally as good donor on your farm what you could flush and for a lot less money um you also know that that donor um works on your farm works on your system 
um, she's used to your forage, she's used to your environment. Um, so for that reason, um, you might be better flushing her than in, importing embryos, you know. So it's really down to you. Um, perfect. Thank you, Tom. Um, I've just had a question through from James McNeil. Um, is there any advantage to using two different bulls when AI IAIing the donor cow? Um, yes and no. Um, we always thought there was. There, there always we always thought that there was um, there was an advantage because. We're not always sure how these bulls work, especially in flushing, um, even in AI. We still, we, we know it's happened for years. We know that some some bulls are stickier than others. Um, so you'd always think, well, if one doesn't work, then another um, would mop up, say. The problem is I, I, I was speaking with a friend who's, um, who's a vet and they found um, a recent study um, what thought that because the two sperm cells didn't recognize each other. They actually spent more time fighting um, than they did, you know, heading towards the direction they needed to go in towards the embryo for fertilization. Um, so it's a bit, I, a few years ago, I would have answered that straight, yeah, using two would be better, but it's not just as straightforward that. I, I don't really know enough about that. I don't think there's been enough research to, to say either way if they do fight against each other however i still i still use multiple bulls in a service probably because i just i still think the theory of if one doesn't work the other one might um is better than gambling all on one bull the only thing is if you are thinking of exporting um embryos if you want to export embryos you can then only use one sire and um, that is only only one size allowed Perfect. Thanks, Tom. Um, we've just had another question through from Rory Scott. What's the largest number of embryos you've got from one cow and are large numbers quite common? Um, great question. Yeah, I, I, they're probably not, not, not that common. The, the average is actually only five or six uh, per donor. Um, probably the reason for that is some give none, some give ten, and soon you're at five or six. The largest we've ever recovered is 87. Um, actually, only 37 of them were fertilized. It was off a Holstein cow uh, in this country. And um, so only 37 were viable, but it's still a, a colossal amount of embryos. The largest fertile flush we've ever had is 60 grade one embryos. Um, that has taken the farmer years to put them in because it, it just, um, Having 60 embryos from one donor is, is unbelievable. You just, you can't use them up. The only thing is it, it sounds great. It sounds unbelievable, but in reality, for a, when a cow has 60 embryos, her, her ovaries are, you know, 30 times bigger than they should be really. And then the aftercare is essential um, in getting them ovaries back to normal, working with your vet, getting a scanned, um, getting getting her back in estrus back bulling um so she's back to normal um the perfect flush is anywhere between you know five and 20. when we start getting over 20 there's even more elevation of hormone it can and it can actually um you know kill the semen more and you can actually just end up with more unfertilized than if you'd only had 10 say so having lots isn't always a great thing Um, um, Bob's also uh, uh, message and it was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, um, has anybody got any other th further questions before we um, kind of bring it to a close at all? Um, um, Tom has got his contact details there on the presentation and I'm sure he'd be open to anybody um, dropping uh, anybody at Celtech an email at any point if they've got any further questions, queries or would like to discuss in more detail. I'm sure that would be fine, wouldn't it, Tom? For sure. And, and that's why it's there, because if someone's got something really in depth, what, what's going to take too long to answer or if someone's got... Um, if someone just wants to progress their own knowledge or find uh, we we have lots of slides or we have we have webinars or you can even become part part of communities and and come along to events and where more embryo transfers going on um but the best thing to do then is just use that email 
and one of us will get back to you. And, you know, we're very passionate about it and we enjoy talking about it. So, um, so feel free, you know, to, to get in touch. Perfect. Thank you ever so much, Tom. Um, um, and that's another thanks from Daniel as well um, and Jeanette. Um, so if nobody else has got any further questions, um, please take down Tom's contact details um, for Celtech. Um, I just wanted to um, give a huge thank you to Tom. I know he's put a, a lot of time in, not just this evening, but um, you know other hours throughout the few days leading up to this and pulling the presentation together. Um, and I know um, from me personally, if his it's a very thorough explanation of the, the ET process and it starts breaking down a lot of the knowledge and understanding barriers that there are to the ET process. Um, um, and I'm sure it'll make us all think about it a lot more and potentially analyze it and look at it from um, an opportunity point of view on farm. And as Tom says, um, can bring in valuable revenue to farming businesses and push on the genetic side um, advancement in our animals and our herd. So just a huge thank you to Tom um, and Celtec for allowing him to speak with us this evening. And if you've got any further questions or queries, please don't hesitate to contact Tom um, or the Celtec team. Um, and the recording of this presentation will be uploaded so you can um, look at it back again, because I'm sure there was some really good diagrams in there um, and listen to certain parts again if you, if you do need a refresher at all. Um, and then we've got our next webinar again in a month's time which um, I think is from um, Crystal X looking at um, fertility in terms of feeding the dairy cow so I'm sure that'll be really um, insightful as well so thank you ever so much Tom really appreciate it and thank you ever so much to everybody for joining us as well thank you cheers see you now bye bye bye